Are the Frogs after anyone else in the transfer portal? We'll talk about that next in Lockdown Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked on Horn Frogs, it is your team every day. I'm your host, Stephen Simcox. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can do that on YouTube. Uh, or subscribe to our podcast in its audio form, wherever it is that you like to listen to podcasts. I had somebody ask me a question on Twitter, which you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Simcox Stephen. The show is at Locked on TCU. If you want to tweet out segment ideas, I try to keep those in mind and try to get to them. Uh, Joe Blinkenship said, could you do a segment on who TCU might still be going after in the portal before the fall? Or are they done bringing players in? Yes, Joe, I can do that. Thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, so things are pretty quiet. You know, we're in the second portal window. I did an episode yesterday about Jordan Hudson moving on to SMU. But for the most part, uh, you're just picking up guys who are really more depth pieces at this point. If they were a big-time factor, somebody who's going to be an immediate contributor, then most likely they would have already been selected. But you can still find some gems. And one thing TCU did really, really well last year Yes, they did reload through the transfer portal, but they got a lot of unheralded guys to play Super Bowl. They scouted really, really well. They went and got Johnny Hodges from Navy. Turned out to be a really good player for them at the linebacker position. Caleb, Fro- Caleb Fox, excuse me, from Stephen F. Austin. Uh, Louis L. Lugac from um, UConn. The list goes on. Josh Newton. I mean, there were a number of players that weren't like necessarily front line just everybody in the country was going after these guys in the portal. But TCU found them, and they ended up being big-time contributors. And it seems like the focus for the Frogs now, as they kind of round out this transfer class, is on the defensive line. Now, they have added a few players uh, from the D-line. They added Tico Brown, um, who was at Central Michigan. Uh, he also spent some time at Missouri State. And then they, they went and added Rick Abreu, the edge player from Eastern Carolina. But I think D-line, in my mind, is the biggest worry for this team. Like, you got Dominic Williams up front. That's that's going to be, you know, your guy in the middle. Uh, but then those in positions, you're replacing Dylan Horton. That's a huge deal with, with the sack production that he had last season. You know, there's a number of guys on that two deep that you're replacing. And, yes, they have some young players coming in, like Marcus Deal and Avion Carter, who were, who were big-time recruits. Uh, but they did not go through spring practice, and I think the chances of them contributing in the fall are, are going to be pretty slim. I, I feel like they'll eventually be good players, but it's just really tough at that position to step in and be an immediate dude. Like Dominic Williams um, was was kind of the exception of the rule in some ways. You don't usually see somebody be that comfortable that quickly as a freshman on the O-line or the D-line, and he had the benefit of going through spring practice and having time with the coaching staff before the season started. So I think that was a big factor in his development um, going into this year, going into last year, excuse me. So this season, I don't think those those guys, even though I eventually feel like they'll be good players for TCU, are going to be much of a factor. So you need more depth. You need more help um, on the defensive line. You got Caleb Fox coming back. You got Tommy Mitchell coming back. Uh, you know, Sonny BC is, is, is going to be a factor this year, hopefully, if he can stay healthy. But a couple dudes that they are are currently going after. So one, they don't – I don't know exactly how, you know, how much traction they have with this player. But Lane Jenkins is a defensive line transfer and edge player from Butler Community College, which is in um, El Dorado, Kansas, 6'6", 255, was rated a three-star, you know, coming out of high school. So the interesting thing about him, he committed to OU and Brett Venables and that staff. But then he decided he wanted to take some more visits, and so he, he's visiting Illinois. I'm not sure if he's made that visit yet, but he's visiting Illinois, and so Venables pulled that scholarship um, or, or pulled that offer. They're basically like, no, if you're going to commit and visit, then and still take visits, and we don't want you. And and Brett's been pretty consistent about doing that since he took over as as the coach at OU, uh, which you know is is that the right way to do things? I don't know. It's just what he's established is what he's going to do. And so that's how it is. But Lane Jenkins is out there. Um, I'm not sure how much traction TCU has with him, but I think that's a player that they would be interested in if there was mutual interest. And the other guys is Corey Robertson Jr. And Jeremy Clark from 247 Sports, Warren Frog Blitz, um, says that Corey should be coming in for a visit 
at TCU, and he has no U connection as well, and that's that he played there for uh, for a few seasons. Um, now, he did not play in 2022, but in 2021, he played in all 13 games the backup nose guard, had 17 tackles, two and a half tackles for loss, and half a sack. He made three tackles in the Alamo Bowl versus Oregon. That was his biggest game of the year. Um, but Corey Robertson Jr., again, experienced player, has been in that OU program for four seasons. Um, for whatever reason, kind of fell out of, of good favor with Brett Venables and that new coaching staff, and so he wasn't much of a factor last year, uh, but was, you know, a backup nose guard for the Sooners for a few seasons and was good enough under Lincoln Riley um, that he was someone that they would call on and that played in all 13 games in 2021. And so you have good size, 6'3", um, 290 pounds, it looks like. And that's the type of player that you're you're going to get at this point. Did he put up huge numbers at Oklahoma? No. But could he come in and be a solid contributor? for this TCU team? I think so. I mean, maybe a, a change of scenery would be good for him, uh, a chance to sort of have a fresh start, and he's got the size and the body type that would really be effective in this three three five scheme. Um, this team is going to have to stop the run. You know, when, when you're talking about rushing three down linemen, it's a huge plus if you can get to the quarterback, but that's not necessarily the way this defense is going to function. Uh, they're okay, you know, not – just wreaking havoc and getting a ton of pressure, but you have to have gap integrity and you have to be able to make plays in the run game. If they get shoved off the ball and, you know, and let those O linemen get up to the second level and third level with relative ease, that's going to be a long day and a long season. So that's my biggest worry for TCU. They're trying to address that in the portal, but again, it's just sort of a slow time of year, but Joe, that's what I think they're going after. That's who I think they're going after in the portal right now. And, I, but I feel like for the most part, they're, they're kind of done. Um, we might see one or two more surprise additions um, or, or names that we hear in addition to those that I mentioned. But for the most part, you're just trying to fill out kind of the rest of the roster, fill out scholarships, and make sure that you have guys that can be available for you on Saturday. But CCU did a really good job of that last year, identifying some underheralded players and the portal that ended up being big-time contributors for them. So we'll see if they can do that again uh, moving forward. When we come back, uh, Sam Kahn from The Athletic had an interesting article kind of previewing the season for TCU football. So we'll talk about that next on Lockdown Horned Frogs. I do want to mention, though, uh, FanDuel. FanDuel, as you see their information there on the screen, if you're watching on YouTube, FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, you can go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. They have this cool no-sweat first bet deal going on right now where if you put as little as $5 down, you can get potentially up to $1,000 and bonus bets, so I feel like, man, I don't want to really dip my toe in the gambling world. Well, that would be a good way to do it. You could get a pretty nice return on your investment if you're willing to make that happen. You can also download their safe, secure, and easy-to-use app, FanDuel. They are the official sports book of the NBA. NBA playoffs going on right now. Nuggets advance to the finals last night for sweeping the Lakers. We'll see if Miami can sweep Boston, and we'll get a – Nuggets Heat Finals, which would be fun. Jimmy Butler, Nikola Jokic, um, some of the star power there. And you can bet on, you know, the money line. You can do some parlays. You can make some prop bets. FanDuel Sportsbook, NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs happening right now as well. Major League Baseball, regular season in full swing. They got it all at FanDuel.com uh, slash locked on, or you can do their app, FanDuel. It's where the game starts. And we're happy that they're with us. They are one of the official sponsors of the Locked On Sports Network. Segment two here on Locked On Horn Frogs. So Sam Kahn, he is a writer for The Athletic, and he mainly covers uh, the Texas college football teams. He's called their Texpert, which is a really a really cool title. But he, he follows college football teams around the state of Texas and follows the Big 12 closely. And so he had an article about TCU, and it was just kind of um, a, a state of the union, state of the program type of deal. Where are they at going into the season? I thought a few things from that were interesting. The first thing he said is that uh, Sonny Dykes and Joe Gillespie and the staff, it took a long time for them to finally sit down and watch the tape of that national championship game. Joe Gillespie said he waited until he got off the road recruiting and took his vacation because he couldn't do it. Dyke said it was kind of what you would expect from a score like that. 
Um, so they finally, you know, put on that tape. I, I guess learned what they could from it. It seems like one of those games that you just burn it because what are you really going to take from it? Uh, but Sonny went on to say you have to do everything you can uh, for it to reflect in the win column. When you're a Cinderella story like we were last year, you're going to get labeled that. We don't want to be a Cinderella team. We want to be a legitimate program. And that's true. I mean, I feel like the national narrative is still like, okay, great season for TCU, but it was a, a one-off thing, a once-in-a-lifetime type of run. And now the question is, can you do it again? That's what these coaches and players are going to fight against and will have to prove is that, hey, can you go into this season and find a way um, to sustain the success that happened in year one? And, and to do that, Sonny Dyke said, uh, you just have to keep getting better. He also talked about um, – kind of what measures a good season. Uh, and and I thought that was interesting because he, he talked about how they had close games last year and, you know, had some game-winning field goals. And sometimes um, you make those, sometimes you miss those, but it, it doesn't really change the process itself. This was a quote. The objective is to win the game, but also the objective is to play as well as you can. Sometimes you miss the last-second field goal instead of make it. But the fact that you missed it doesn't mean your program is off the rails. Make sure you're progressing, your roster is deep, and you're more detailed in what you do every day. Um, and so, yeah, he's right. Like, there is – as fans, we just look at the wins and losses, right? And so, for instance, TCU, they go and they don't play their best game against Baylor last year. But they get down there on the, on the final drive – and they kick that field goal. They get the bazooka field goal. Griffin Gill knocks it down. A ton of things could have gone wrong in that scenario, but they didn't. But even if something went wrong and they didn't make that field goal, it really doesn't change the fact that they played, you know, they, they played well enough on that last drive to win the game. It was just the result itself wouldn't have gone in their favor. However, I get what Sonny's saying. I was looking back at last season, and yes, TCU was not just this absolutely dominant you know, buzzsaw of a team that was knocking the doors off of everybody. But this idea that they, you know, there's this idea that the season was kind of fluky or lucky. Honestly, though, I mean, aside from that Baylor game, which, yes, that was, you know, last second fire drill field goal, definitely could have gone the other way. Oklahoma State, triple overtime, had to survive, had to come back in a huge way. But, I mean, even the Kansas State game where they came back, they won that game by 10. West Virginia, which was close for a lot of that contest, won by 10. Texas Tech, <clears throat> where, you know, the Red Raiders seemed like they were in control of that game for three and a half quarters, still won that game by two scores. Went down the, you know, went down the field late against KU and scored a touchdown um, to win that game 38-31. But they led for a lot of the second half. Um, there were some – there were some 50-50 games, but it wasn't like every single week this team was on the edge of losing. I, I feel like that's, it, you know, in the moment it seemed like that, and I sort of talked about that, that it was always hanging on a thread. But I think when you when you take a step back and get some more perspective, um, it, it wasn't as, you know, as dire week to week as sometimes we thought it was. There was just so much pressure on the team um, to stay undefeated because we knew – if they dropped a game, it felt like their playoff chances uh, could end. Uh, Joe Gillespie also spoke, and he said he's excited about this defense. He thinks they can move a lot faster. So far, everything that we've done um, in class we've been able to put on the grass, and it looks really good. So this defense should be moving at a faster pace in 2023, should have a better understanding of their assignments, and that gives you a much higher ceiling as a team if they can get to a place – um, where they're shutting down offenses. Because aside from kind of a, a short run last year, especially in the second half of games, that was a definitely a bend but don't break defense. But they made the most of what they had. They improved a lot from two years ago, and hopefully we can see them take another step forward this year. Um, overall, I like the mentality of this program. I think there is so much that they learned and hopefully was valuable and all that extra practice time that they had. And, yes, it ended in a way that none of us wanted to see happen, but hopefully that is a motivating factor um, for the team going into this season. And if you want to read more about, you know, what Sam Kahn says, what Sonny Dykes and Joe Gillespie think about this group moving forward, you can do that on The Athletic. That's where it's at. Uh, we'll come back and wrap things up here in a moment. This is Lockdown Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. 
Final thing for you, I did want to give a shout out. I should have said this Monday, but um, TCU men's tennis. David Roditi, the head coach there, they had a great season. They got to the final four, um, came back. They lost in the Elite Eight. They lost the doubles point to Michigan, and they were down one nothing. And they were going to have to win four out of those six matches uh, in, in the singles part of the match to get it done. And they were able to do that. You know, they they beat Michigan four to one. They advanced the national semifinals, the final four. And then they ran into Ohio State and, unfortunately, um, just could not take care of business against the Buckeyes. Dropped the doubles point again, and then the singles got away from them. And so did not win a national title, which was disappointing. Um, but an incredible season for Ben Sinis. They did win a national title uh, in the indoors for a, a second straight season. Uh, and only three losses on the year. Lost twice to Texas and then ended up dropping um, a game to uh, Ohio State in the semifinals, and that was it. And so uh, just an incredible year for the uh, for the Frogs. And Texas actually lost in the semifinals as well to Virginia, um, and then Virginia went on to, to win the national title over Ohio State. So uh, Texas and TCU, who appear to be the two best outdoor teams in the country for most of the season, they did not end up meeting – in the national championship game. But tennis is such a grind. It's such a long season. Uh, the men do have the singles and doubles championship coming up, and so they'll participate in those tournaments. But another big-time year from David Rodidi and company. And, uh, yeah, along with beach volleyball, they had just an incredible run this spring, and it was fun to follow that. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll have more coverage of TCU Athletics. This is Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team every day.